This week, we are going to be talking about parenting, Skeeter style. I'm Rose Skeeters, host of From Borderline to Beautiful, a show about hope and recovery for BPD. As I mentioned in my earlier podcasts, I became pregnant with my son while in an abusive relationship during my doctoral studies. Wow. As I say that, I realize just how intense and tumultuous that time in my life was. Needless to say, I was not exactly equipped with the skills that a new mom would need to nurture a child, as I had been unable to nurture myself and my interpersonal relationships up until this point. Now, I would like to think that parenting is an issue that is quite separate from the borderline diagnosis, though in believing that, I would definitely be believing a lie. Having BPD means having significant deficits in both social and emotional skills. Think about it. We said that people with BPD have effective instability or difficulties regulating their emotions. We said that people with BPD have intense, unstable relationships marked by idealizing and then devaluing others. We said that people with BPD have angry outbursts and often have a hard time controlling their anger. And we haven't even touched upon the emptiness, identity issues, and suicidal ideation and anything else that comes with BPD, right? So let me ask you a question. How can we as parents teach our children how to regulate their emotions, how to develop a purpose and an identity, how to love unconditionally, how to nurture themselves if we don't know how to do it ourselves? And what if we happen to have a two, three, or four-year-old who is in the discovery phase of their life and the testing boundaries phase? Let's say that no matter what you say to this child, they scream or cry or simply say the word no. If you have BPD and you're having an off day or your partner just got into a fight with you or you're feeling particularly suicidal, how would you respond to your child? I know that many people with BPD are inherently good people who want the best for those around them, including their loved ones and their children. I know that because I knew that the struggle for me was always being that person, even though I was emotionally uncomfortable. And I know that because that's what a lot of my clients, all of my clients with BPD are. They're really good people and they need help getting there. They need help being good people all the time. I also know that when we are uncomfortable or feel out of control, the people around us feel it too including our children. All right, time for some more hard truths and honesty. If you're out there and you flip out at your child, pinch them, ignore them, call them names, argue with them, assign diagnoses to them, or whatever other negative thing that I cannot think of in this moment, ask yourself, do you want your child to grow up bearing the burden of pain that you bear? In other words, do you want to protect your child from having mental illness like BPD? Or do you want them to bear the same emotional pain and intensity that you do? The answer to this question is the one that drove me to change. So what, am I saying that people with BPD are abusive to their children? No way. No. I'm sure that there are people out there that do abuse their children and also have BPD, but in no way is this some gross generalization, so let me be clear on that. And one way that I can do that is by telling my own story a little bit and how I helped my son change. And then I'm also going to get into a few strategies today that you can use to kickstart your parenting journey so that everyone can feel more calm and safe at home. When I was a single mom to my son prior to my recovery, my BPD meant yelling, eating froyo for dinner, too many toys and trips to Toys R Us, and being his bestie. (laughs) My now 10-year-old 
was between the ages of two and four during these events. When he would throw tantrums, for example, I would rescue him rather than institute age-appropriate consequences. I remember knowing that I did not want him to tantrum in public. So whenever we would leave a place, and you know how hard it is or how hard it can be to get a kid to leave when they're having a good time. I would whisk him away in my arms, twirl around, dance and sing so he was distracted by my impulsive singing and so that he would not get upset. Sometimes I would even buy him ice cream or something so that he would stay happy. Doesn't sound so bad, right? If I had a bad day or was feeling particularly unmotivated, tired, or grumpy, I would want a delicious snack food. <laughs> we would eat a late lunch and then go to get frozen yogurt at dinner. We'd watch movies instead of playing or I'd let him sleep in bed with me and blur that boundary. Also, doesn't sound so bad, right? When we were playing, I had a hard time with imaginative play and was staying focused on one task. So we would go from toy to toy in a few minutes, bouncing around from one thing to the next. Again, no big deal, right? I'm still hanging out with my son, right? Wrong on all accounts. Here's how I discovered this and why I started to change. I sent my son to a Montessori preschool. It was a private school with very loving instructors. This place was awesome. It was wonderful. But my son began to stick out like a sore thumb. He had poor social skills, difficulty listening and following directions, difficulty attending to task, and was impulsive. Well, let's just strap a diagnosis on this kid, shall we? And get him to a therapist, child psychologist, let's medicate him. Oh my gosh, he's got BPD, he's got mental illness just like me, and I need to get him treated, right? Wrong again. This not a diagnosis when a young kid like that acts out. Not yet. The problem was me. I hadn't taught my son that rules are rules and that following directions comes with, or not following directions comes with consequence. I hadn't modeled appropriate social skills to my child because I didn't have many friends or connections at the time. I was impulsive and did not model attending to task. As a matter of fact, like I said earlier, I modeled the exact opposite, jumping from task to task I did not regulate my emotions well. So all of this together made my son appear to lack cognitive empathy. So he seemed to lack remorse, in other words, when he did something wrong and he had a temper. Hmm, is this a little sociopath in the making? No, the apple just didn't fall far from the tree and all he was doing, which is what many children do, is modeling the behavior of the adult in their life that's all. So when the school wanted me to get him a TSS, if you don't know what that is, that's a therapeutic staff support or a support worker. I knew it was time to change and put my foot down because I knew that I was the problem. I could see that. So I was really against that knowing that I was a problem. And that is when I started connecting my own journey with that of my son. He didn't have any diagnoses. There was a time where he had Lyme disease, and so they thought that he had a tick disorder, but he ended up having chronic Lyme. And outside of that, once he was treated for the Lyme, he didn't have anything. But I'll tell you this, he sure as heck would and will develop diagnoses if I don't protect him and continue to protect and nurture him and actually parent him instead of trying to be his best friend. So how, how do you parent? Great question. <laughs> Today we will start with two strategies on how to begin incorporating your own recovery into your parenting to provide your child with the resiliency they need to grow into a strong and capable person without having to bear the same, without them having to bear the same emotional burden that we have had to bear for so long. So 
There's so much that goes into parenting and relationships and all the topics I choose for the podcast. So for today, we're just going to talk about two things. The first thing we're going to talk about is one, two, three magic. And before you start laughing, give it a chance. (laughs) And the second thing we're going to talk about is core values. When I talk about one, two, three magic, people often tell me they tried it and it didn't work or they reference super nanny or they laugh those are the three initial reactions i typically get and this is for people with or without bpd but look it works it's not the strategy of reward and consequence or discipline system that fails it's our adherence to it again it's not the strategy that fails it's our adherence to it I know that I personally needed rules to follow in order to recover. I needed things spelled out for me exactly as they had to be implemented. With 123 Magic, I had a game plan with rules and all I had to do was practice consistency and self-discipline to implement these rules. Clearly, that is the hardest part here because many of us lack the ability to maintain consistency when our emotions get the best of us or when we are anxious and uncomfortable. But it takes practice, so keep at it, and here's how you do it. The first thing you need to do is choose target behaviors. What are reasonably, reasonable things or expectations that you expect of your child? Now listen, if you don't know what's reasonable to expect of your child, then first, please research what is age appropriate in terms of expectations. Don't set your expectations so high above age level or too high because your child will definitely stop trying, feel like a failure, and when they go to try something new in the future, they'll assume they'll fail because they can't meet your demands. This is where anxiety and perfectionist development. Once you have chosen your target behaviors, write them down as a family rules list and post them in the house where everyone can see them. If you need to, use pictures for younger children. Explain the rules to your kids. Then, if you see a target behavior happening, you can refer to your rules list, which would be hanging right in a common area of your home. Don't yell or scream or try to control the situation. Simply say the rule and that's one. For example, let's say your target behavior is no hitting. You'll say, no hitting, that's one. If the behavior continues, you say, that's two. And if it continues again, you say, that's three. At this point, the child is engaging in socially inappropriate behavior, so they can do one of two things. They can run laps in appropriate weather like in the yard, if they're, you know, especially if you have a particularly spirited kid or an active kid, they running laps is a really great way to connect movement and consequence and calm. All right, so they can do that or they can go into timeout, which let me just be clear, timeout is not kneeling on rice or kneeling on the hardwood floor or standing in a corner or any of that. It's just going into a separate space alone until they choose to be good humans. If you choose a timeout space, set a timer that equates to their age. If they're two, they can sit for two minutes, three, three minutes, 10, 10 minutes, and so on. During the timeout, you can't say anything. As a matter of fact, you only want to say the behavior and count. You don't need to react any more than that because You don't have to punish your child's character. And arguing with a child is a silly thing to do. Remember this, children cannot comprehend adult emotions. They can't understand adult emotions. So when you argue with them and you start to get more and more frustrated and angry, they often don't understand why that is happening. And it makes the situation way worse and way more tumultuous. So one, two, three, And then this rule is for you. No talking or arguing with them. If you are freaking out internally, because you might, that's fine. But remember your mission. You said you didn't want your child to bear the burden of your emotions, right? 
So walk away, breathe, and stay as calm as you can for the few minutes that this is happening. Now, if your children are out running laps in the yard, let's say a lap per age, this is a good one for more um, active and older kids. If you have a six-year-old with a temper tantrum, for example, or a temper, for example, laps would be a great option because it teaches them that physical movement helps them calm down and it prevents destruction in the home sometimes. <laughs> have them do enough laps where they are tired but not exhausted. I can't really tell you how many because I don't know the size of your yard or your basement or the fitness of your kids. So you'll have to sort this out in a reasonable way. Now, you know that our perceptions are often skewed. So if you need to consult a friend, family member, or some neurotypical individual or your partner, do it because you'll need help. Once the child has completed the timeout or the laps, you can explain why they're in timeout or doing laps. You had a consequence because you hit your sister. We don't hit in this house. And then here's a big one. Make like the frozen lady and let it go. Let it go. Do you want to teach your kids to move past hard emotions? Model moving past hard emotions. Model letting it go. Forgive them. You don't have to punish them all day for something that happened at 7 a.m. If you hold resentment towards your child, they will become disconnected from you. Don't punish your child's character. Give them consequences for the behavior they engage in. Consequences are really important. You know, I know a lot of people have had ch early childhood trauma or narcissistic parents and, you know, they it's hard for us to really that group of people to want to put consequences on our children, but they're really important. Consequences when given appropriately, they're limits that we place on behaviors so that children can feel safe and know where they stand. Think about it. Let's like use the example of a stop sign, okay? Think about stop signs and adults. You're supposed to stop at a stop sign. That's a rule, right? You can't just roll through it. But <laughs> sometimes we do because there isn't always someone there to enforce the rules. So when you first get your license, you know, we're probably more likely to stop at stop signs and follow the rules of the road. Maybe we're nervous or it's just new to us. But then time passes and we start to loosen the boundary a little bit and try to bend it. So maybe we roll through the stop sign and maybe we even blow through it. But then we get pulled over and that consequence reminds us that we need to follow the rule. Let's say we never get pulled over. We run the risk of blowing a stop sign and getting into an accident because of it, which is another consequence and reminder that we should have stopped. Children need this sort of system to feel safe and secure. Without a firm boundary, children don't know what to expect. This breeds anxiety in you and I, and even more so in a little one. Especially if you're a yeller and you're usually really calm and quiet, but one day you just explode on your kid. That child will, will keep pushing you until you explode because they're pushing the boundary to figure out where your stopping point is. So if you set new boundaries and you start one, two, three, all you have to do is stay calm and use the system and do that consistently and your child will, will adjust in the same way that you would adjust after having gotten pulled over or gotten into an accident after not stopping at that stop sign. So set boundaries and use a clear, calm, consequence system with your children. Don't do it for a day, two days, three days. Tell me that your kid wouldn't be sitting time out and started arguing with you and it wouldn't work and that would never work for your child. You know, don't give up before you even try. Try for a long period of time until your kids can adjust, until you can adjust. Don't argue with your kids and don't expect too much of them or expect them to take care of your big emotions. Don't punish them all day or hold resentment against them. Let it go. This is hard work, but it's worth it. Remember your mission to raise children that don't have the pain of mental illness or BPD. Keep at it.
Are you tired of feeling frustrated, resentful, or disconnected from your family, friends, and partner? Thrive Mind Body LLC Mindset Coaching and Counseling can help you. Visit us on the web at thriveonlinecounseling.com. Again, that's thriveonlinecounseling.com. And receive 10% off your first session pack with coupon code THRIVE10. See you then. The second thing I want to talk about today is instilling core values in your children. A few episodes ago, we talked about having a moral compass and why this is important. It's a hard concept at first to wrap your mind around, though once you get started in recovery and you go through some of the other steps I talked about, it becomes a bit more clear as to why a moral compass is necessary. Take lying, for example. If we choose honesty and integrity as two integral components of our moral compass, then we can begin to bring into our awareness how often we lie and how often we lie when it benefits us. If we can see the difference between who we think we are and who we want to be versus who we actually are and how we act, then we can create change. In order to provide our children with the resiliency skills they will need in the event that they are genetically predisposed to having mental illness, and in the event that they are older and need more support as they model our BPD behaviors, we need to provide them with a strong moral compass. That's our responsibility. This is great news though, right? Seeing as though, you know, we're supposed to be doing moral compass work too. I mean, according to me, right? It's not part of any other treatment, but uh, I really think that that's something to be worked on continuously. So having to teach your kids, I mean, it just helps reinforce it for you. Now, remember in a previous episode featuring recovery stories, I talked with Devin Green. So if you need to go back and hit up that episode, totally do that. Devin and I began working together in the context of parent coaching, actually, because she has a three-year-old daughter. And Devin and her fiancé, when we first started working together, they started with the one, two, three magic. And it worked really well for them until it didn't. So there are times where it gets difficult because our own emotions make it hard for us to stay calm during that timeout period. So Devin and her partner had to look inside themselves to see what was missing. Why was she getting so frustrated at a child? The biggest thing we realized is that Devin did not know how to love unconditionally and how to nurture because nobody ever loved her unconditionally and no one ever showed her nurturing or how to nurture. So she had to learn it while at the same time instilling those values in her daughter. I had to do it too, and I continue to do this with my son. This is definitely an ongoing process for you and your child. I suggest doing what Devin did. Take poster board or large pieces of paper and make an art project out of this. Choose the core values that are most important to you and that you want for your child and write them on these posters. And write the definitions too. Let's say that forgiveness is a core value you want to instill in yourself and your children. Write forgiveness down and then define it. So forgiveness is deciding that the person who has wronged you doesn't have to be pay, doesn't have to pay or be punished anymore for what they've done. Make the definition simple, you know, maybe even use some of the ones I have here. The the simpler the definition is, the easier it'll be to implement that core value. Let's take courage, for example. Courage is being brave enough to do what you should, even when you're afraid. Being brave enough to do what you should, even when you're afraid. Determination. Deciding it's worth it to finish what you started. Determination is a big one because if we had parents who were really strict or expected perfection from us, we typically fail before we try, right? So instill determination in your kids. Decide, actively choose that it's worth it to finish anything that you start. See it through. Humility. Putting others first by giving up what we think we deserve. Love. Choosing to treat others the way we want to be treated. And how about this one? I don't think I've talked about this before, but joy. 
Joy is finding a way to be happy even when things don't go your way. So you can choose joy by looking for happiness even when you're not getting what you want. Teaching that to a child is huge for them. It means that they can be disappointed, not get what they want, and still see a positive outlook and still see the good in things. Now, we've talked about BPD too and some of the tantrums that we have and some of the mood swings associated with social skills stuff, right? So choosing joy is something that we as adults with BPD need practice with as well. <laughs> All right, so now choose one or two of these values and work on them for a whole month. You don't have to overwhelm yourself and try to learn all of them at once. That's too much. One at a time. Read them to yourself and to your children every day and talk about how you can be determined, honest, and brave. Try to stop your children acting like, so try to stop them when they're acting in accordance with the values and praise them for it. Talk about it and also spot yourself when you do this too. Ask yourself when you get frustrated or angry with your children. Does your love actually look like love? Is that really love when you're yelling and screaming at them? If something happened to your child and they left the earth, all right, this is rough, right? But it's important to think about. If something happened to your child and they left the earth right now, would what you are angry about really matter? Ask yourself that. Does it really matter? Are you showing them love or are you so angry and frustrated that your words are coming out as hate? Do your words hurt your children and make them feel bad about themselves or do they build them up? Align your actions with the words and the definitions of your core values so that you can model and teach these to your children. Having this compass and direction will give them something to stand behind so they can develop and build an unwavering sense of self. That way, no matter what happens, they can choose joy, be honest, brave, humble and honorable people and you would have showed and taught them that now that's something to be proud of listen anyone can ask for help and support and empathy in the midst of a struggle that's easy work it takes strength to do the hard work it takes to grow and change and then seek validation in the pride you have for a job well done so celebrate hard work practice celebrating hard work effort and being strong in your mind and your children will be protected from bearing the burden of emotional pain and intensity this is just one part so as always please feel free to email me at rose at thriveonlinecounseling.com if you have any questions or if you want to work with me on this we'll definitely talk more about parenting in future episodes so let's do some Q&A. Today, I'm going to take a question from Michaela over at the Facebook group from Borderline to Beautiful, Hope and Help for BPD. And Michaela wanted me to talk a little bit about BPD and attachment and how the original attachments we have with our early childhood caregivers may continue influencing us throughout our adult life. So... I think that this goes with anyone and attachment. You know, when we look at the way that how we were parented and how we were attached to our primary caregivers shaped our lives, I mean, it's not just a BPD thing, right? It's going to influence how we love, what partner we choose, what we think love looks like, how we feel about marriage or don't feel about marriage it would influence how we treat our children like we said in this episode so it's really important to look at the connection that you had with your mom dad foster mom or parent or whoever raised you grandparents as a child and see you know what was that like a lot of the times and you can see this a lot when you work with parent when i do parent coaching and i work with um, moms and dads and their kids i can see that in younger kids like seven eight nine their behavior often directly mirrors the behavior of their caregiver and that pattern sort of will continue into their 
into their um, development. So let's just use an example because this question is great and I'm going to devote an entire episode to attachment, attachment theory in the future. So right now I'll just give an example and then we'll go into more detail into it in that episode. So let's say you have a narcissistic mother, for example, or father. And let's define narcissism for a minute. So narcissism is a selfish worldview um, and it, um, the person, a person with narcissism lacks empathy and is, and expects perfection, perfection of you. And then even when you do the thing right to the way that they want it perfectly, quote unquote, that they've asked of you, it's not good enough. Basically, you're just never good enough. Um, and let's say that that is your mom or your dad. Well, in those relationships, as you grow up, you're going to have stunted development because you're going to start internalizing some of the things that your parents do as character flaws, right? Like, let's say your parent um, is down on you and you, they say like, why can't you be more like your sister? Or you love your father more than me, or you love your grandmother more than me. Or they say things like, look at everything I've done for you and you can't even do this for me or you're breaking my heart. Or when you know, you're 13 and you say to your mom, I hate you. And she's like, I hate you too. You know, a lot of the times those behaviors really affect the way that we see ourselves and the way that we look at the world around us. So we have, if we have this insecure attachment or this, um, reactive attachment or just this like even in simpler terms feeling that the person that's caring for us is not able to keep us safe doesn't trust us and doesn't love us and will attack our character if we don't meet their demands then we grow up being anxious afraid and scared to try anything because we're just scared we're going to fail. So we just live this life that we're not good enough and that we're failures. And usually we'll pick a partner who treats us poorly. Well, a lot of the times people who get into domestic abuse relationships have had a parent or an early childhood caregiver who is not nice to them. So that love relationship that they have now as an adult mimics the abusive love relationship and the conditional love relationships that they have had as a child. You know, so the way that we are parented and the way that we attach to our early childhood caregivers sets the stage for the relationships that we have in the future. Now, granted, these things can change. So if you're a parent yourself and you have a child who isn't really connected with you, if you start working on that relationship by doing some of the things I talked about in the podcast, you know, and there's more to it, right? But you can repair the relationship and you can change the way that your child thinks about love and really teach your child what unconditional love is. But yeah, I mean, our, our attachments early on, they really play a role in the way that we have friendships and relationships now. I mean, just this whole unconditional love bit. If your parents only loved you when you were doing the thing that they thought you should do or the thing that they perceived to be right, and you know they were really mean to you when you weren't doing that, well, you know, you have a tendency, you'll have a tendency to become a tyrant too, because that's what you knew love was, right? Or let's say you had a mom who was always like, don't tell your father, you know, who always condoned lying. And then you grow up and I'm talking about being honest and I'm talking about lying. Well, you don't have any experience with that. So, you know, in an effort to stop rambling, <laughs> the bottom line is, is that we're going to model the behavior of our early childhood caregivers. And because we have a temperamental disturbance, um, we can distort the perception, our perception of reality to believe that our parents don't love us even more than the initial trauma reaction. So I'll get into all of that when I talk about attachment styles. Um, but I just wanted to address your question and say that, yeah, those those attachments in early childhood definitely, definitely impact the way that we love now. So go back and, you know, look at what your relationship with your early childhood caregiver was and how that impacted you. Like I said, with Devin and her daughter, 
and with myself and my son. I didn't know what unconditional love was. Devin didn't know what that was because they didn't, she didn't receive that as a child. She didn't know what nurturing was. So now she's tasked with parenting a child, nurturing a child, and you know, how are we supposed to do that? You know, so those attachments are incredibly influential throughout the course of our lives. Awesome. Well, thank you for the question, Michaela, and I will definitely be sending you over a message when I do the attachment podcast and BPD. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot for today's episode or for listening in, and I'm looking forward to next week. Okay, thanks for listening. That was from Borderline and Beautiful, a production of Thrive Mind Body LLC, online coaching that helps frustrated individuals, resentful couples, and disconnected families navigate through tough times. Visit us on the web at thriveonlinecounseling.com. If you like this show, remember, you can hear it on Anchor or Apple Podcasts or Pocket Casts or any app that you use to listen to podcasts. Subscribe to get a new episode every Monday. If you want to get in touch, you can leave me a voice message. Some of you had some comments and questions from the last episodes, and I'd love to hear whatever questions you have too. Just download the Anchor mobile app, search for From Borderline to Beautiful, and tap the message button to send me a voice message. We'll have all those links in the show description. Okay, we made it. Thanks again for listening. I'm Rose Skeeters, and I'll be back next week with another episode of From Borderline to Beautiful. Talk to you then.